Good morning, everyone. Vinny, thank you so much for inviting me um, to the Workday Ventures Analyst Chem. Really excited to be here. Um, I am the CEO and co-founder of Pymetrics. Pymetrics uses soft skills and unbiased artificial intelligence to help make all workforce decisions more accurate and more fair. So I'm very excited to be here presenting. And uh, since we don't have an audience, Vinny, if you have questions, please feel free to jump in at any point, this is always much more fun if it's interactive. Uh, so I'm gonna start off by saying, why do we care about soft skills? Uh, a lot of people ask that question. I think it's a, it's a very valid question because we're used to evaluating people based on their experience and their hard skills. So why do we care about soft skills? There is a lot of data now uh, that shows that soft skills are really critical for the future of work. So about uh, there's a, been a 12% growth in soft skill intensive occupations, and 92% of talent managers say that soft skills are just as, if not more important than hard skills. And yet I would say that employers in general talk about having a difficult time identifying or measuring soft skills. So 89% of people Since soft skills are yeah. a soft definition of soft skills, how do you yeah. define soft skills? Sure, yeah, actually, so we have, um, we, I think we just sort of go um, with a fairly standard definition. Um, so I'm gonna flip to the next slide and say that soft skills generally are thought to be sort of traits and natural abilities that are more inherent to a person. That's on average how people define them. Doesn't mean that there aren't other ways to define them. Some people think of soft skills as, you know, do you know what clothes to wear to an interview? Do you know how to you know, write a, um, you know, personalized uh, email, et cetera, et cetera. We would put those more in the hard skills category. So anything that's experience and can be learned is really more in the hard skills bucket. Um, soft skills, again, this isn't our perspective. I think this is sort of the industry or scientific perspective is that soft skills are more things that are natural and inherent. That doesn't mean that they can't be modified or trained to some extent, but I always equate soft skills to athletic ability, right? So I might be able to work on my tennis game, but I'm probably not gonna become an NFL linebacker or a ballerina anytime soon, right? And so why are these soft skills so important? They're so important empathy, for- right? Empathy would be a soft skill, for example. Yeah, empathy would be a soft skill, for example. Yeah, and so my background, again, just pulling back a teeny bit, um, I was trained as a cognitive scientist. And so my sort of view on people is that everybody is different. Everybody has different strengths and weaknesses and no strength or weakness is invariably always good or bad. It really depends on the role that you're being asked to, asked to, asked to take on, right? Or the, or the job that you're in. And so for example, people always think of empathy as like, oh my goodness, it's like the critical skill for everything. I can think of five occupations off the top of my head where it's actually probably not good to be empathic, i.e. bouncer, <laughs> I probably don't wanna be too empathic, i.e. CIA agent, um, i.e. You know, there's lots of th places where being overly empathic, being um, you know, able to work with very sick populations if you're overly empathic, right? You, you can't work in those environments. So my point in me mentioning that is I think we as a, we're going a little off topic, but I think we generally tend to hone in on these things and be like, oh, it's always good to be this, or it's always good to be that. And this is not true. When you look at the world of work, it's really, it's all about fit. So anyway, so- but why do we I love your bouncer example. I mean, that's, yeah, that's totally. <laughs> so totally. Absolutely. Or people, or people that have to work with very, you know, challenging populations, whether it's, you know, abused children or, you know, very sick patients. I mean, if you're overly empathic, you will actually have a difficult time going to work, right? It doesn't mean you don't care, but empathy is really taking on someone else's feelings. And that's, can be, you know, counterproductive in certain environments. Anyways, so Thank you. bottom line, why do we care about soft skills? Two, four main reasons. One is that they're durable. So while my CV might become irrelevant overnight, let's say, you know, I was a scientist, I went to, wanted to become a business person. All of a sudden my science CV, it didn't really matter if I was able to operate an MRI machine that was irrelevant, right? So, but soft skills are far more durable and they're also future facing. They tell some, you what someone could do, not just what they have done, right? And then unique to Pymetrics is that they are both equitable and flexible. And we'll get into that in a minute. Um, actually, sorry, let me just take a minute to explain that here. So what I mean by that is historical. There, there, you know, you've done so much work in this area. Are there environmental factors that contradict the durable definition? I mean, do you find yeah. that people lose a certain trait under certain pressures? 
Sure. It's again, it's a bit like your athletic ability, right? Um, can you, can your athletic ability completely atrophy if you don't use it? Absolutely. But are you sort of a natural, do you sort of fall in a particular spectrum when it comes to athletic ability? Yes. Like, you know, I'm a good runner and skier, but I have terrible hand-eye coordination, right? As an example, right? My daughter has great hand-eye coordination. So, you know, I can train as much as I want, but I'm probably not going to have that, you know, innate hand-eye coordination. And again, I think the thing to think about is that it's not about assigning good or bad um, every aspect of a person's personality and cognitive style can be adaptive. It just really depends on kind of the fit, fit to role. Um, anyway, so if we get into that, so how do we, how do we measure soft skills and what do we do with them? So Pymetrics um, uses a cognitive science approach to measuring soft skills. Um, we capture inherent cognitive, social, and emotional attributes using behavior-based activities. So again, People call them gamified, but what that really means in our case is that they are looking at your behavior on something rather than asking you to self-report. The advantage here, and, and in our case, they're all scientifically based. These exercises have been used in research for decades, and we just purpose them for the sake of career um, assessment. What that does is that it really allows someone to get an objective read on someone, and it also, again, makes the system very flexible in the sense that we're not looking at whether you responded to something in a good or bad direction, or if you got something right or wrong. It's again, back to does this profile of you, where does that fit best in the world of work? So we measure core soft skills using our core uh, platform. We also added quantitative skills for you know occupations where that's important and then communication skills as well. And through the entire platform, we measure 11 different core um, cognitive, social, and emotional aptitudes broken out into these different factors. And again, what we do then with these factors is that we assume flexibility. So it's an entirely flexible system whereby there is, so let's just take decision-making for example, or let's take attention. So attention falls on a spectrum of um, methodical. So some people are quite methodical all the way to the other end of the spectrum, which is biased to action. Bias to action is what it sounds like. Um, and so we found through our research that people that are in sales or you know, people that are good at entrepreneurship tend to be, no surprise, more biased to action. People that are in more detailed occupations like law or accounting tend to be more methodical. So that's a perfect example of where there is no right or wrong. I personally am more biased to action, so we'll probably not make the greatest lawyer or accountant, but you know, I'm pretty good at sales and, and entrepreneurship. Does that make sense? So they're all fit like that. And so then what we have done is we've mapped all of these factors to occupations. And so we have a vast library now of occupational codes where we can say, look, if you are methodical and you are somewhat frugal in your generosity and you are a spontaneous decision maker, you will be good at this set of occupations versus this set. Does that make sense? So it's and a so, multidimensional, multidimensional approach. Uh, absolutely multidimensional. Yeah. And so the way that, and so just to just highlight curious, again. Where would generosity, what occupations does generosity score high on? Oh, goodness. Um, you know what? I don't have that answer off the top of my head, <laughs> Vinny, but I can definitely get back to you. I'm sorry. I don't want to say something and then sure. have it be. No, no, no. Wrong. That, that's sometimes fine. these, sometimes these things, actually, you know what? It, I recall from early research, but I'm not sure if it's true that actually entrepreneurs tend to be quite generous, um, which I guess should surprise no one because a lot of times they're trying to fix a problem or do better in the world. But again, I don't know sort of the library of occupations where that's important. And sometimes it's very sort of self-evident and there's like, you know, you're like, oh, of course. And then other times it's actually quite interesting to see, you know, sort of where professions fall. Like, for example, like the, another one that's self-evident is that you know, finance folks um, tend to be quite frugal, right? So on the opposite end of generosity. Now that shouldn't surprise anybody, right? But there are these times where we find, you know, sort of profiles that that are somewhat um, surprising. So again, we're, we're hoping to publish on some of this research. Um, we've been so busy building the platform that research has, uh, we don't get around to doing as much as we'd like. How does Pymetric stand out? There are obviously other soft skill systems. There's personality assessments, there's traditional cognitive testing and so on and so forth. So there's really three ways. Um, one is that we're fit-based. So again, 
historical soft skill systems, whether it's personality tests or cognitive tests, sort of assume directionality, you know, sort of personality tend to test, uh, you know, people sort of tend to say, oh, if you're conscientious and agreeable, you'll always make a good employee. And if you, you know, you're not, you're not, again, I go back to the, you know, CIA agent or the bouncer example and say, hmm, are those people agreeable? I'm not sure, you know. Um, and so I think that science is a little bit dated and sort of based in sort of 20th century understanding of people. So we're fit based. And then the other thing that's really critical is that we are unbiased. So what that means essentially is that an unbiased system um, basically equally um, recommends people of different genders and ethnicities for occupations. That unfortunately has not been true historically. And that's something that we've spent a lot of time making sure is true for Pymetrics is that we essentially have um, equal representation of people matching to different career um, and occupational um, pathways based on gender and race, which we think these days is super important. You, really you, were, talking about the, you were talking about CIA agent. I read, I forget where I read it, but it was how the CIA is recruiting in a social media savvy world. Yeah. They don't want the agents to be completely invisible, right? Right. So it's a question of what do you publicly share and what you not publicly yep, share? Totally. <laughs> you were saying. Oh, I was just saying that I was just picking on CIA agents and bouncers. You know, I, I don't actually have any, you know, I, all I'm saying is that I think historically we've really over indexed on people being agreeable and smart and saying, oh, those people are good everywhere. Um, and then if you're not, you know, agreeable or smart, then, you know, you don't have a, you're, you're less optimal as an employee. And I think that was sort of, the problem that I saw in business school is that all these companies would come to, you know, the business school at Harvard and say, oh, all these people can work out everywhere. You know what I mean? They're smart. Hopefully they're agreeable. They can work out everywhere. And, you know, these kids were, you know, intelligent and they would prep for their interviews and they would get the internship. And then, you know, half of my classmates, you know, two days into their internship were texting their friends being like, I hate my internship because they weren't a soft skill fit, right? So I think we have to move away from this idea that like certain types of people can do well everywhere and others can't, and it really embrace more of a fit-based um, system, so. Great, well, there are really four different ways that you can leverage the Pymetric soft skill system. So you can use it in talent acquisition, and that's how we started, but 50% of our clients at this point use us for mobility, reskilling, learning and development and workforce insights anywhere where you again need to um, enhance your understanding of someone and move beyond this purely hard skill assessment which again you know workday has a wonderful tool called workday skills cloud that really is a fantastic way of understanding somebody's experience and sort of resume based fit but at this point very few platforms can provide that soft skill um, that soft skill layer, which is so critical to, to making sure people are successful across the employee life cycle. And then the other thing just to note is that one of the ways that we work with our clients and partners is that we actually provide the data that we um, collect through API outputs. And they're really sort of two primary ways that we give back information. So one is role agnostic. What that means is I can tell you, Vinny, who you are as a person, not specifically how you fit to a particular role, but just who you are, right? The way that you would use like, I don't know, a Myers-Briggs or something like that to really understand who you are. This can be very helpful in L&D context. It can be really helpful for all sorts of sort of internal activities within an organization to understand team-based um, approaches and so on and so forth. That's one really important piece of information. And then the second part, important piece of information is more of this role-based um, fit. So what we can do is tell anyone sort of their fit score to any role that we've measured, as well as a an explanation of how they fit to these different roles. So there are two different types of outputs. Both are equally important um, and they get used in, in different ways, as you can imagine. Great. And just across, you know, the four areas that we um, measure and track for our clients, so efficiency, diversity, effectiveness, and experience, really, generally speaking, and we'll see in some of the case studies, we see improvement in all four areas. I think people assume that using you know, an automated platform will make things more efficient, but they are really coming to us for help with effectiveness, so finding people that will stay longer, perform better, and so on and so forth. 
Diversity is a absolutely critical initiative, I would say, across all companies that we work with. And then also candidate experience, right? Um, the, the resume black hole is called that for a reason, right? Meaning <laughs> nobody gets any information generally when they apply to a company. Anyone that goes through Pemetrics in the application process gets a little bit of information about who they are. They get a shortened version of that development report. So even from a candidate experience perspective, it's engaging, people learn something about themselves. And actually people post their, their Pemetrics profiles on LinkedIn all the time, which is always something that we enjoy seeing. So, so gender, ethnic, um, diversity, is a quantitative mapping of certain soft skills to gender or ethnicity, or is that still an evolving science? No, actually it's the opposite. So if you recall that slide where I said unbiased soft skills, so we actually have built the platform to select soft skills that are known not to be biased across race and uh, gender. That isn't to say that there aren't some soft skills that are known to be, but the reason we went with ones that are unbiased is because you can't actually help with diversity if you measure things that are more prevalent in men than in women or in Caucasians than in African-Americans, for example, right? Because then you're just going to repeat. Um, you're just going to find a profile. That then bias. Exactly, right. So what we did intentionally, and there's lots of soft skills that are unbiased, at least as measured by cognitive science, is we said, let's hone in on those. Let's measure those in non-diverse populations at times, right? Because a lot of our uh, workforces that we're working with are still overly Caucasian, overly male. And let's measure what makes those men um, successful and then know that we can find those soft skills in equal proportion, if you remember back to the unbiased point, in equal proportion in women and equal proportion in people that are not Caucasian. Does that make sense? So that's actually like a critical component of the system. But thanks for asking. That's a common, commonly asked question. Great. So if you don't have any more questions about sort of the overall platform, I'd love to dig into just some go, of go back the, to the experience part. Yeah, so this is experience sure. from a employee point of view or employer yeah candidate and employee yes exactly yeah and so all the point here that we're trying to make is that i think a lot of times employers um historically i think had sort of given up on candidate experience they just assumed that it wasn't going to be great and you know it's a job and nobody likes applying for jobs well i think now people have really understood that everything about sort of the the overall process um they want to be more and more engaging like a consumer experience right now and so the fact that we give everyone feedback, everyone that goes through Pemetrics, either as a candidate or as an employee gets feedback about themselves, who they are as a person, they learn something about themselves. And that very act, which is actually quite, what, quite unusual for a soft skills platform, I think engages people and really makes them feel like, okay, I learned something about myself and I can take that information with me going forward. Great. So Vinny, if you don't have any other questions, I think you just want to cover three um uh three sort of case studies that i think bring you know, home before, before you do that i am oh, sure. i deal with a number of supply chain and other um, industrial um use cases and yep. everyone looking at automation right because of talent shortages yep i think there may be a role for what you offer which is you know machines don't have any soft skills yeah and before we automate too much what are we going to miss with the automation? That yeah. kind of, I don't think companies are thinking through that issue as much. I, I agree. And I think, you know, I think what's important to understand is, and I'm not sure we do such a great job of this, but I think it's important to understand where are people and soft skills critical and where are they not? You know what I mean? And so let's take recruiting as an example. Um, you know, people often ask us, well, Pymetrics, don't you, um, disintermediate the human touch. And what I say to people is, no, not really. Like where Pemetrix is used is in the process of a recruiter whittling down 250 resumes to the 20 that they're going to interview. That's not a human to human process. No recruiter I've ever spoken to says, oh, I love going through resumes. It's the joy of my life, right? Um, so if we can help them hone in on people, by the way, in a much more equitable way on the people that they should be bringing in for an interview, right? I think that's a good way to, and then they can actually spend time interviewing people and, and really spending time in that human to human interaction, I think that's a good use of automation. In, you know what I mean? Because otherwise it's being done in all these shortcut methods that actually lead to lack of diversity and increased homogeneity. Because a recruiter left to their own devices, if they have to go from 250 to 20, is gonna look for schools that they're familiar with, 
um, employee referrals and so on and so forth. And by definition, that's going to be a less diverse pool and not necessarily equitable, right? My point simply being that I think we have to think carefully about sort of where are places that we can introduce some technology aids that will actually make the world, you know, sort of more equitable and better functioning versus places where we don't. And I think that that's still an, an open question, you know? Sure. Great. So again, so just three case studies, um, you know, so there was a, a multinational bank in Asia, ANZ, um, that was looking to use Pymetrics to drive a more fair, efficient, and engaging process. Um, they were really looking to improve diversity um, and also bolster candidate experience, as well as obviously find people that um, were more likely to be better fit for um, fit for the role. And so, you know, we were able, and again, this was across their sort of early career grad hiring. And, you know, what we were able to see in fairly short order, um, you know, was improvements in all of the areas that we just described, right? And so again, we didn't remove the CV process. They were still, you know, um, putting in their CVs. Um, but what we were able to do was really, obviously, again, automation was, was able to reduce um, recruiter screens, right, which is something they were looking to do. But I think the more exciting stuff for us in any case um, was that they were able to find people um, that were uh, far more likely um, to receive an offer than the, than the process uh, that they had before, which is always exciting. Um, and there was an increase in socioeconomic diversity, which is something they were absolutely looking to do, as well as an increase in candidate satisfaction rate. So I think overall, they were really excited by, again, the, the reduction in recruiter screens, that was a little bit sort of table stakes because that's what they would be looking for an automated tool to do. But the fact that they were able to find better fit candidates and increase socioeconomic diversity, I think was um, is, really impact, impactful to them. Is your customer base pretty global or? It is pretty global. Yeah, it is. So about, I think it's about cultural differences and what people define as soft skills. Yep. Abs uh, not in what people define as soft skills, but certainly, so in the case of ANZ, what we did was basically use um, what we call custom profiles. So the soft skills we measure because they were developed by research that was global in nature. So these cognitive science tools get used in research labs across the globe. So in Asia, in South America, in all parts of the world. Um, so the actual soft skills we're measuring are quite global and all of the games are nonverbal for the most part, like you're doing stuff, but it's not really language based. Um, so we actually know that the soft skills they measure are quite, are quite ubiquitous and, and quite not, not culturally anchored. What does differ are the profiles, right? So when we work with an organization, typically we're using their own employee base to, um, to determine what makes for success in a particular role, right? And so you can imagine that those profiles are quite different. So a sales profile in Asia, for example, might be different than a sales profile in North America, but the actual things that we're measuring themselves are not different, if that makes sense. Um, moving on to another, uh, <laughs> another, um, case study also from Asia, uh, uh, UOB was actually really excited because one of the things that they were looking for was really to ensure, um, you know, better retention of uh, people in their personal banker um, role. And this is obviously, you know, a role that's critical to the bank um, and one that they had really struggled um, to, to find talent that was well suited for. Um, and so again, you know, along with sort of improvements in, you know, um, diversity and other things, they were really excited to see that Pymetrics recommended hires um, were 25, 24% more likely to perform uh, better than folks that were not recommended, um, as well as an increase in higher ratios. So again, much as, much as, even though I would say that folks are excited about, you know, diversity, um, performance and candidate experience. I think people select our tool usually based on a particular thesis that they have. And in this case, it was really trying to um, get folks that perform better. And that's not uncommon, especially in sales roles where it's fairly easy to look at data and say, okay, were we able to um, improve performance? Um, you know, we often see that as a reason to, to purchase the tool. Um, moving on to a non-finance uh, client, <laughs> um, we were excited to also work with Kraft Heinz. So Kraft Heinz was 
also um, looking to power actually a completely different part of their um, the organization. So they were looking to do, um, it, they were looking basically to identify um, best fit business placement for um, certain trainee hires uh, while providing learning and development enablement. Um, and they were really excited to, so I should back up for a second. Kraft Heinz has been a uh, client of Femetrix now for uh, quite a while. Um, they have seen similar improvements um, in diversity and candidate experience. They've had some really pretty striking improvements in both gender and ethnic diversity. But then what they were able to do or they what they wanted to do was move it from the TA space into the talent mobility space, which was really exciting. Um, and they started out as a pilot, but now expanding much, you know, much more broadly. Um, and so what they wanted to see is, OK, we've been using Pymetrics now as a recruiting tool. We've seen all these gains in you know, candidate experience and diversity, both from a gender and ethnic perspective. How about if we use it internally? Right, because a lot of times folks are struggling to understand, OK, now we've hired these folks, especially now with sort of the great resignation and whatnot. We've hired all these folks. Um, now what? Because you know, if we don't provide them with sort of a more engaging experience, and if we don't provide them with career mobility op um, opportunities, they might leave, right? And so this was kind of the the idea behind Kraft Heinz and their um, TM pilot, which now rolling out more broadly. And what they were able to see, which was really, really exciting to them, was that 51% of trainees were a high fit for other opportunities within the business, right? So typically you get hired into a particular role and then you're kind of pigeonholed. And what they were able to see here is that half of the folks that were in role A actually had a high fit um, somewhere else within the business. So that was really, really exciting. They also saw that even with this voluntary approach to the tool, three quarters of people who were sort of introduced to the tool were went through and completed it. Um, and 70% um, were satisfied with the Pymetrics development report and 80% of the managers were satisfied uh, with the development report. So obviously looking to get that employee satisfaction a little higher, but I think for a pilot that we did in a, a client that had been using us now for TA for a number of years, um, rolling it out in the mobility space and getting such, you know, sort of high fit recommendations. Are you, are you finding, have you found in the last year or so the use cases are moving more towards internal mobility or is it still external yes. recruiting? Absolutely. No. So back to that initial slide where, you know, we can power, you know, TA, but then all these other places, 50% um, of clients are now using us for insights, mobility, or learning and development, you know, from a standing start of zero um, two years ago. Right. So that's actually like really fast adoption. And we see this more and more, even this year, it's been really accelerating, uh, you know, because of things like the re great resignation. Um, and, you know, I think that that's having an impact in two ways on the push towards using things for mobility in the sense that um, one, people want to retain folks and retaining people isn't just about finding the right fit people in the beginning. It's also about providing them with other opportunities back to this 51%. But the second thing is that more and more, I think it's, you know, the labor market is really moving towards a more job seeker friendly environment, right? And so what people want to do is use mobility and learning and development as an employee retention tool by saying, look, we're going to invest in you. We're going to put effort into figuring out what your career path could be. We're going to put effort into learning and development and tailoring those programs, right? So more and more we see L&D and mobility as really an employee engagement and retention strategy that is around the message of we're investing in you and we care about you. And that's what differentiates us from, you know, sort of peers in our, in our space. So, yeah, so this is really exciting. So again, it was a early days with this engagement with Kraft Heinz, but um, from a TM perspective, but again, you know, from that, from their perspective, resounding success, and and they're eager to do more now. From an external recruiting perspective, the three customers you presented yep. all seem to be slightly more junior or entry level folks. Yep. Um, is that the best? Uh, no, use no, case? not at all. Generally speaking, we get used by. Um, for early career stuff, about uh, you know about sixty percent of the time and forty percent of the time for experienced hires. So it really is. I mean, it's not yeah. half and half, but it's getting there. And I think that uh, you know, again, I, I think maybe you know potentially, I think some of the um, reasons we have more early career 
case studies is because it takes a few years to kind of, um, you know, see the, um, you know, kind of get the results. And I think sometimes it's easier to track those in these early career programs. So again, you're seeing case studies where we have like strong results, but it does not necessarily map to the broader, the broader engagement. I mean, we do partner hiring through BCG. We do a lot of different sort of experienced hire, um, uh, you know, engagements at this point. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.